Hello and welcome to uh, lesson four of this half term GCSE English language. As you can see from the title slide, this is going to be some planning and preparation for a formative assessment. So before we go into that, let's have a look at what the objectives are and the outcomes. The outcomes you can see are two things. There's going to be a five a day, which is very familiar to you, and a short plan for uh, what we're going to call a mini essay. A little bit more about that now, though. So let's talk about the formative assessment and the who, why, what, where, when and how. So firstly, who is it? It's everyone, because we're all taking GCSE English language. What is a little bit more detailed? It is what I'm going to call a mini essay response, very much in the style of paper one, question four. Now, so far in class, you've done an awful lot of work on questions one, two and three, less so on question four. There's a reason for that. Question four is the most difficult question, but it also uses the skills that are developed through question two in particular. Uh, talking about language, the effects of language and so on are incredibly important there. As you can see, it's worth 20 marks out of 40. Uh, therefore, the response is expected to be a bit longer. In an exam situation, you would spend 20 or 25 minutes writing that answer. Though obviously we're going to be spreading that down over two or three lessons in total. Why are we doing this? Well, first of all, it's learning. We're learning how to approach that type of question uh, because at some point, whenever lockdown and so on ends, you are going to be back in school and you will be taking some form of exam. Probably more interestingly for you in the short term is it gives you a bit of feedback. It's a progress check. You'll get a band and a broad indication of grade back about this when you've eventually done it from your teacher. A little bit of feedback to act on uh, so that you can make those steps forward. Where? Do it on the usual Google Doc. So whether you type directly onto the Google Doc itself or whether you work on paper, you take a picture and then you attach that into the Google Doc. Whatever you usually do with your teacher, it's exactly the same thing. When? <clears throat> the lesson sequence there is correct. It should actually say lessons four, five and six. This lesson is going to be about the planning. So we're going to have a look at how to do that and we're going to do it. The next lesson will be about the writing and it'll follow the same format. Lesson five, you'll then get some feedback and there will be some follow up on that. So to make it very clear what we're going to be doing. By the end of the lesson, your page, whether it's a Google Doc or whether it's a piece of paper, should look like this. You start off with your title and then you have your five a day, which will come in a minute. Then you're going to have an essay plan, which looks roughly like this. You'll have three to five quotes with some fairly detailed comments on there, which we're going to look at later on. I'm going to give you some uh, examples, some ideas. So if you follow the lesson, there's no way you can really fail at that. Some of it is actually using contents that you've done in your last lesson. Now, now is a good time for us to talk about the quality of what you do as well. At the moment when we're marking your work, whether we're writing it on there or not, we are keeping a record and we're grading your effort and the quality of work that you're handing in from one through to three. One means good effort and engagement. It means you've clearly worked hard. So we've got all the things we'd normally expect. So that means that tasks are completed, obviously, but also that they're at a standard which reflects what you can do when you work hard. Two means it's acceptable. It might not be perfect. There may be room for improvement and quite possibly your teacher may will give you some feedback saying, please improve this or correct that or change that. Three is just not acceptable. Not enough effort, not enough engagement. Now, let's have a look at the five a day to begin with. First question, name three characters from an inspector calls. Question number two, name one poem from the anthology which presents nature as powerful. Question three, give a quote from that poem. Question number four, go 369 on the quote, decrease the surplus population. Now go 369, in case you are unfamiliar with that phrase, uh, means to explode that quote, but to talk about all three AOs. So AO1, we can talk about who says it, what it shows about them, whereabouts in the story it is, maybe some other quotes that link into it. 
AO2 is very much about the writer's methods, so about language. So you could talk, for example, about the word surplus. In this quote, uh, Scrooge is saying that people may as well die and decrease the surplus population. Surplus there is implying that they are excess to requirements. So there's a lot that we can say there about how it presents him in an incredibly negative light. <clears throat> AO3, we should be talking about what the writer is trying to achieve. So when he presents Scrooge in this very negative way, who is he actually getting at? He's not just getting at the fictional character Scrooge. Who does Scrooge represent? Whose views? Also, there's a, a thinker who this phrase comes from, surplus population, somebody who wrote about population uh, and the problems of population, who you will have heard of, so I'm not going to give you the name. But again, there's a, a link there into that. Question five, give a character overview for Scrooge's nephew, Fred. Include his social class, his views on charity and Christmas. So when we talk about social class in A Christmas Carol, remember that the terminology is slightly different than some of your other texts. Social class is very much a product of, of time and moment. So the terms that we would use to talk about social class now are very different than 50 years ago and in turn 50 years before that. If we're talking about a Christmas Carol, we need to decide, is he the uh, abject poor? Is he incredibly poor? Does he have no fixed, term, fixed means of employment? Is he the working poor? Is he in the middle classes? Is he the affluent middle classes? That means the wealthier middle classes. There's nobody in this novella, really, who you would say is probably in the upper classes, so you wouldn't use that term. His views on charity and Christmas, what are they? Uh, who do they uh, contrast in the novella? OK, now before we go on to the main task, let's have a quick recap of the story so far. <clears throat> in Heroes So Far, Francis Cassavant has returned home to Frenchtown after being injured in World War II. He has terrible facial injuries and wears a scarf over his face. He also hides his identity because he intends to commit murder. He's haunted by his memories of Nicole and returns to where she used to live. However, she has left Frenchtown and nobody can yet explain why or where to. And in chapter three, in particular the part that you read last lesson, chapter three, part two, we can see that he cannot escape his recollection of war and he has vivid, traumatic dreams. And that brings us to the question. The question itself is phrased more or less exactly as paper one question four would be phrased. It has a statement and then it asks you to what extent you agree and gives you some bullet points to remind you of the things that you should do. So firstly, in this section, the writer presents Francis as traumatised by war. He is both physically and mentally broken. So the, the statement we're being asked is, is he traumatised? To what extent? And it's differentiated here between physically and mentally broken. Perhaps more importantly, though, are those bullet points. Consider how he's presented in the section, evaluate how the writer presents. And it's that word how in both of those statements there. In the first instance, how can be what impression we get. It also wants us to talk about methods. So how he is presented, so what methods and techniques are used. So what language techniques are used in particular word choice, but other linguistic techniques as well. That's vital. And evaluate. The word evaluate is in there to remind you that it's your judgment. You have to have a point of view and you don't just limit it to Francis being traumatised by war. There is so much more, so much more nuance and so much more complexity that we can talk about there. And you need to, to think about that and, and express it and don't be afraid of doing so. The final bullet point is a reminder about using quotes. Support your response with references to the text. Give quotes. If we're not using quotes, it's going to be extremely difficult to actually say much of value. And certainly in a language exam to really get any sort of grade on the board at all. <clears throat> now, you could talk about anything in chapter three, part two. However, I've chosen to focus on the latter part of that. So let's have a look at the beginning there. I make myself a cup of cocoa, stalling, delaying the moment of going to bed, despite the cold. 
The clock on the wall in the ship for Banjo tells me it is 25 minutes after 11, which means that a long night stretches ahead. I yearn for sleep. My eyes roar and burning, but I know that the dreams will begin when I close my eyes and drift off. For me, that is the, the first quote that I would be looking at, um, because it really does show us the, the, the depth of trauma. And this is how you should be roughly laying out your plan. You have uh, the quotes and then we have a few comments based on them. So I've got the quote there. And then first of all, the how I've noted down about the impression. There's physical and mental fatigue and suffering. He yearns for sleep. He's denying himself this. His eyes are raw and burning. Those are the words to do with pain. The how, the methods, we've talked about some of those just, just then, but yearn, yearning is a desperate longing. He, he needs this, but he is denying himself. And the reader asks why. Raw reinforces that sense of desperation. Raw sounds like a wound, an injury. Um, and that's a very interesting choice of word here, because obviously he is wounded, not just physically, but yes, physically. And the reference to dreams implies, that of course, they will be disturbing. They'll be nightmares. <clears throat> so in the question focus, the things we'd say about that Yes, he does seem traumatised because he feels he cannot sleep. On a physical level, he is suffering perhaps because of the psychological trauma. He's avoiding sleep because he is afraid of what will happen, afraid of what he will remember, the images that will come up in front of him. Uh, he's constantly preoccupied. War is inescapable. Now, in the next part of this extract, I've read down towards the bottom, um, and I won't read that for you. You can read that. You've read it already. But I've focused on this bit here. He says, I don't want to think about them, those GIs in my platoon. I don't want to recite their names. I want to forget what happened there in France. But every night the recitation begins like a litany. The names of the GIs like beads on a rosary. Now, there's two things in there which I would like to focus on. There's the litany and there's the rosary. Both of those linguistically link into Roman Catholicism. A litany is a type of uh, prayer. It links into a feature of prayer in a Roman Catholic service. Um, we use that word more casually as well to mean uh, a list, more often than not a, a negative list. If we talk about a litany of failures, um, it means a, a long list of failures. Um, so that could be interesting here because Francis feels guilt. <clears throat> There's no doubt about it, especially those friends who he has lost, and it seems there's quite a few of them. Rosary beads are used uh, as a way of keeping count during prayer, apparently. So again, we have language which links into Roman Catholicism, which is the, the dominant um, denomination, uh, religion, uh, in the background to this book. Um, but instead of him thinking about religion, about God and, and so on, he is thinking of his friends, and it's almost ritualised his behaviour. So, I've got the quote there, and what things would we be saying about it? Well, we've just gone over some of those. As you can see, um, I've not given you quite so many um, clues here, but obviously I think we've covered most of them. So the impression, he is um, haunted. Uh, yes, he's traumatised. We keep coming back to that word. Um, and his behaviour seems ritualised. He's adopting some of the language and the rituals of, of the church. But actually what he is focusing on is the, the terrible traumatic experience of war. Some of those words there, the recitation, when you recite something, it's when you repeat it over and over again, often in a, in a ritualised fashion. The litany and the rosary we've mentioned so if we go back to that question focus, yes, we can see some very clear psychological trauma. I've used the word already, ritualised behaviour. He keeps rehearsing the scene, going over his memories because they're inescapable. You get a sense of claustrophobia from this section. It's like he sat in the, uh, or light, laid out in the little tenement and he's, he's trapped, not just physically, but psychologically as well. Now. That's how the section continues, um, but uh, of most uh, interest to me would be the bottom part of it, which we've already looked at in the previous lesson. That's the slide from that lesson where you 
were asked to take out uh, some quotes and to annotate them and talk about the effects of language. So this is where you can use some of those same quotes um, and use that knowledge and start getting it into the answer. Now, as you can see there, I've suggested four different things that you could talk about um, and any of those or other, other indeed would do. Um, but I'm going to talk about the German soldiers in white uniforms. You choose your quote and put it into that bottom left box. Um, if I was putting the quote in there, as I say, I'd choose the one about the uh, ghost-like soldiers. The impression, well, I think I think the, the ghost thing here is important. It relates to him being haunted by what he's seen. So I'll be talking about him being haunted. Uh, and in terms of methods, the language reflecting that. We have the direct reference to ghosts and the supernatural to things that we can't um, uh, escape. Um, but also the use of white, which we talked about in the last lesson, which was curious and interesting. The fact that white is often linked to innocence and purity. And again, maybe we're getting into signs of guilt. He's killed these two young German soldiers. And later in that extract, he mentions the fact that they were young like him. He could see their youth. He makes the uh, reference to apples and this image of something kind of fresh, uh, something which has been ruined, spoiled, broken, destroyed. So we could talk about any of those things there. Going back to the question focus, again, this is psychological trauma, isn't it? It's memories, flashbacks coming back to him. In our modern language now, we talk about post-traumatic stress disorder. Hopefully that's been of some use to you. So here's a reminder, by the end of the lesson, the things that you should have on your page should be laid out roughly like that. Remember for the essay plan that your teachers will have different expectations of you and you know your teachers. So for some of you, three quotes and comments may not be enough. You may know that the expectation is higher. And in turn, you know that the quality of comment is what makes the difference between uh, uh, something in, a, in the low end of band two and something at the top end of band three to band four, so pushing towards a grade seven, the two people may have the same quotes and very similar comments, but it's the quality of expression and vocabulary and detail of what you say which differentiates, which makes the difference between you getting a so-so grade and a good grade and a great grade. So think really carefully in your plans about getting more detail down, more words, and think about tentative phrases. This could, this might, this may. This is just a plan. It isn't a full essay answer yet, but what we're looking for is for the evidence of thought there uh, that you can take forwards and in the next lesson turn into a decent essay. So there's a reminder there about the sort of feedback you're going to be getting there. On top of anything else from your teacher, you're going to be getting the one, two or three, making it clear to you where you stand. And then next lesson, we can take it forward and we can turn that into a piece of writing.